fell in love with the sport. It was a life-changing moment for me. And in 2012, I made a massive leap of faith and became a full-time professional triathlete. It completely inspired me and reignited the competitive juices that I had had for so long as a kid. Hi, and welcome to Iron Women. I'm your host, Sarah Gross. The clips you have been watching are from a documentary called Two Packs to a Six Pack that documents the journey of professional triathlete, Sarah Piampiano. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the show. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having me. So, Sarah, I've known you for a little while. I think we met back in, oh, Cozumel? What year was that? Do you remember? That was my first race as a professional athlete. Did you I, know that? It was. That oh, was yes. 2011. 2011. 2011. And it was my second race back after my daughter was born. Yes, and you did two Ironmans in back-to-back back back. weeks, right? Yes, uh, yes. And I remember we finished really close to each other, didn't we? Yeah, we, we were did. like sixth and seventh or something like that. Anyway, but since then, you've become a world beater. Um, <laughs> 2015, an amazing year for you, seventh in Kona, and your first Ironman win, right? Um, yes, yes, congratulations. And uh, tell me a little bit about how that feels now that, you know, I know you've worked a really long and hard time, like we all do, you know, yeah. to get there. How does that feel for you? Uh it feels great. It's, you know, for me, I think at the end of last year, I kind of breathed a sigh of relief a little bit. I think um, so many of us who kind of take this journey on and trying to be a professional triathlete, I mean, it's hard. It's mm. very rigorous. There's a lot of risk involved. And I think when you have those moments of success, it's just, I mean, you've had them when you, when you, you know, had that year where you won two Ironman races, you just are able to kind of soak it all in and almost relax for a second because all of that hard work, you know, I'm still, I still have big goals. I still have a lot of things I want to achieve, but it was just really, really nice to see all that hard work pay off. Yeah, I can totally, I'm totally hearing yeah. you there. <laughs> for sure. Um, it's and just so, like for a second you're like, oh. yeah, right. So <laughs> just my best advice to you though, is don't let that you know, move to the next goal really quickly because it's, yeah, it's yeah. too easy. Well, I'd be mad if it was like, you know, you can't rest on your laurels. And I, I, you know, in my mind, I'm like, of course, I'm not going to. But just for that moment, right, you know, just mm -hmm. to end my year, you know, I had my great result in Kona and then went and won my first Ironman and my last race of the season. It just, for those five weeks where I was doing not very much, it, it was just, there wasn't as much stress as I've had in past years, um, right? You know, cool. where I just felt like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? There was just this moment where, okay, you know, okay, I, I worked really hard. I actually got to this level. I actually, I can achieve my goals. I think. Yeah, and you're actually for a while. It feels like you're trying to prove yourself or your worthiness as an elite athlete or as a pro. And then when you know, yeah. when you finally get those results, it sort of feels like, okay, I, I belong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. and you certainly do belong now. Um, and so the last uh, couple years, you've been shooting a documentary. Um, I watched yes. it last night, and it was really interesting just to see your story about coming from a pretty big-time job in New York City, right? Yeah. Um, and smoking, you know, getting into some bad habits, and then taking up triathlon. So, you know, tell me a little bit about that story. Sure. So I was, as a kid, I was always very athletic. I was a nationally ranked runner and I um, was a very competitive ski racer. But when I got to college and then uh, sort of out of college, all of that just went by the wayside and I became very consumed with, um, with work for the most part. I mean, I was working very long hours. I worked in investment banking. So um, it was very rigorous and demanding from a time perspective. Um, I was often working you know, 100 or 120 hour weeks, which is, is sort of hard to imagine. But um, when that happened, everything that I had been passionate about as a child growing up and in my college years just completely 
became deprioritized. I just, it wasn't something that I, I was really focused on. And I ended up ha- leading a pretty unhealthy lifestyle. Um, you know, I was working long hours. I didn't really have a lot of life balance with respect to um, having time for family and friends. And I, and I did take up smoking and I at one point was smoking, um, you know, upwards of a pack to two packs of cigarettes a day. Um, and on a whim, I was with a friend actually at a, at a bar um, in New York City, and he had gained about 50 pounds since college and had signed up for a triathlon. And um, one thing led to another, and I ended, up, you know, I ended up betting as to who could beat the other person in the race. And that's how I signed up for my first triathlon. And at the time, I didn't really think much about it. You know, for me, it was just kind of a competitive, friendly bet. But what ended up happening is I went, I did this race, um, and it kind of reignited that competitive spirit that I had when I was younger and, and growing up. And also, it was a massive mental relief for me to go out and, and do this competition, you know, just to go out and do something healthy for myself, to um, push myself physically in ways that I hadn't for such a long time. And I was sort of instantly hooked. And, um, you know, from there, I, I ended up really taking taking the sport up and starting to train more actively. I gave up smoking. Um, so for me, doing that first triathlon was a, was a massive um, trigger and inspiration and motivation for me to start leading a healthier life. As triathlon, As triathlon is for so many people. Um, the addiction, um, the addiction to smoking, smoking is it. Um, um, tell me a little bit. Because one of the things that when I was watching the documentary, I thought, okay, you know, you know, was it hard to, it's hard for a lot of people to give up smoking. Was that hard for you? So the interesting thing is that I had wanted to stop smoking for quite a long while. I wasn't, I hadn't been a big smoker for a long period of time. I think I was smoking maybe for five years, um, which is long enough, That's yeah, right? Yeah. But it wasn't like I had been smoking for 15 years or anything like that, but I was, I was smoking heavily mm-hmm. and I had wanted to stop smoking, but I just, honestly, there was just nothing that was really motivating me and really inspiring me to do that. It's like when somebody goes and they, you know, they decide they're going to join the gym and go to the gym every day, but there's nothing really getting them excited to go. That's kind of how it was with smoking. So I would kind of try to stop, but you know, then I would go out to a bar with friends or, you know, friends of mine would go down and be having cigarettes and one thing would lead to another and I would just keep on doing it. And when I went and did this first triathlon, it was honestly, I just quit like that. Really? You know, it had been so hard for me to stop smoking. And then I went and did this first race and it was so motivating and so inspiring for me. And I wanted to do more of them that I literally just instantly stopped. I would say that I dreamt about smoking for about a month. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting. So just, it's so interesting to me that you just stopped, but that it took possibly a goal or something. Do, what would you say it was about triathlon and moving to the next goal that, that made you quit versus before when you thought about quitting and couldn't? What, what was it? I think for me, it was kind of, it just reignited that competitive spirit for, you know, within me where, um, you know, again, I mean, I, I had been kind of wanting to lead a healthier lifestyle, but, and I, and I had joined a gym actually, but there was nothing really motivating me to go to the gym. There was nothing really motivating me to stop smoking. And I went and did this race and I had been such a competitive person um, athletically growing up that all of a sudden I was super motivated to get in shape and be healthy and start eating better and you know, do all the things I needed to do to go back to the next race and see how much better I could be. So it definitely was that competitive drive that... Um, that was the trigger me, for you. Yeah, it gave me the motivation. It was a trigger just to, to stop. And I think, you know... If I'm challenged enough and motivated enough, it kind of showed me that you can sort of do anything, right? Absolutely. And the one thing that stuck with me when I was watching too is that at one point, I think maybe your friend mentioned that you were down to about 90 pounds. Was that kind of stress or was there some disordered eating there? Or how did, you know, how did that happen? Yeah, so I went through a pretty stressful period in my life. Um, actually, so just in my job alone, when I got out of college and I started working those crazy hours and not sleeping very much at night, I lost about 25 pounds. Um, not, be, not because of disordered eating, but I just, the stress associated right. with it. And then along, 
around that same period of time, I was actually, I'd been in a long-term relationship. We actually were engaged to be married and I was, um, I really didn't feel like it was the right relationship for me. And as we got closer and closer and closer to the wedding, the stress for me was just mounting and mounting and mounting. And that ended up resulting in me losing more weight. Mm. So I got between the stress of sort of not being in the right relationship and the stress and the lack of sleep from my job. Um, I definitely was not eating. I think I remember in that moment thinking to myself that I was never even hungry. Like I probably could have gone for days without eating. It wouldn't even be that big of a deal to me. Mm. So it wasn't, for me, it wasn't that I was trying to lose weight. It was just, I think, the environment that I was in and the situation yeah. that I was in that led to that. Well, it's amazing what stress can do to your appetite, for sure. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, it's interesting because I always think that I'm a stress eater. Mm -hmm. But I think when your stress levels get to a very, yeah. very extreme level and you're in just a world of hurt, it actually, you know, it may not be that case. <laughs> right. So then the process from getting from where you were for that kind of the smoking, the stress, to full-time training, how, <laughs> how long did that take and what, what are the sort of highlights of that process? Sure. So I did my first triathlon in 2009 and then um, where I was merely kind of just a participant and then I went and I did a second race and when I did the second race, I was a lot more competitive. I won my age group. I, it kind of validated that... Uh, you know, I thought that I had some talent and maybe I might be able to take this more seriously. Mm -hmm. So over the course of 2010, that's the point where I started really training with some intensity and um, with a level of focus that, you know, I, I hadn't had before, obviously, because I hadn't been doing it. Over the course of 2010, um, you know, I didn't have a coach. I was just really on mm -hmm. my own. Um, trying to go out and, and compete in these races. And then at the end of 2010, I started working with Matt Dixon from Purple Patch Fitness, who is my, still is my coach today. Mm -hmm. um, at that point in time, I had qualified for my professional license. Mm -hmm. And when I started working with Matt, he said, you're not ready to go pro. You know, this is not just not, you're not in a place where, where you can go do that. You're just going to get completely steamrolled if you go and start racing professionally right now. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll coach you if you um, hold off on going pro until I say that you're ready. So I continued to race as an amateur through 2011. Mm -hmm. um, actually, at that point in time, I approached HSBC, which was the firm that I was working for, and asked them if I could um, begin working reduced hours for one year uh, to see if with the added rest and um, you know, less, not as much kind of responsibilities from a travel perspective mm. in the office, if it could enhance my performance, maybe to the point where going perfect, you know, starting to race professionally would be a feasible thing. And so throughout 2011, I had reduced work hours. I only worked four days a week. Right. I didn't travel. I was working with Matt Dixon and over the course of that season, um, I think I won every single overall amateur title um, with the exception of one race and then was the top American amateur at Kona. And at that point, um, Matt said that he thought that I was ready to, to begin um, right. racing professionally. So you took some risks in terms of reducing your work hours, some financial risk, and you really put a lot of eggs into the training basket at that point, right? I did, but yeah. I also think that it was like a very calculated um, transition. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people just say, oh, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to go and race professionally. Mm -hmm. And actually, I had this sort of buffer where it wasn't like I was going and work, working full time to racing professionally full time. Right. I was able to cut back my hours. Yes, I did. Wasn't making as much. Um, I had to take a big pay cut. But there was still that job security. Right. There was still sort of the notion where at the end of that year, and, and HSBC did did do this, where the, at the end of the year they said, okay, we gave you this year. What are you going to do? Are you mm -hmm. going to come back and, and be working full time for us again? Or are you going to go race professionally? So it just gave me this opportunity to explore um, something that I was passionate about and thought that I, I might have a chance to to really go and do full time, but it wasn't like I was just completely ripping the bandaid off um, right. all at once. So that was great. 
Right. It makes sense. And now you're, you know, you're trying to get that message out there about, you know, sort of your story, some of the things you learned and that other people can learn. Tell me about the Habit Project. What, what is it, first of all? Yeah, so the Habit Project is a website that um, we created about a year ago, mm -hmm. um, and we're currently in the process of um, revamping and doing an overhaul of the website, so hoping that it's going to get launched in the next couple of weeks. Um, cool. But it was really motivated and inspired by my own journey, which was um, going from a pretty unhealthy, unbalanced lifestyle to a lifestyle that I feel very good about. And not just because I made a professional change, but um, you know, I, I'm just in a much healthier and happier mm -hmm. mindset and, and headspace than I had been previously. And so the idea is that um, everybody has bad habits. Everybody has habits that they would like to change. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes it's across nutrition life balance or fitness or, or mm. the, really the three main categories. Mm -hmm. And um, even though you might have a bad habit, you may not have the inspiration and the motivation to actually make that change. And sometimes it just takes one small thing. You know, for me, it was happened to be going and doing a triathlon that actually creates that inspiration and motivation to, to start right. making changes in your life. And so it's just it's supposed to be um, this online social community that um, gives tips, gives challenges, offers support, um, has articles, is kind of an inspiring place to go and, and visit, and, and hopefully it will motivate people to start making some positive habit changes. All right, for life. people who have sort of these bad habits, as you say, you know, like smoking, nutrition stuff, drinking, anything, yeah. um, have a place to go, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, it's been really interesting too, like I've talked to a lot of, um, you know, bloggers and um, motivational speakers and people just kind of in doing research for for the website and mm -hmm. um, looking for people to contribute and things like that and one of the big things that I've walked to you know messages that a lot of people have kind of conveyed is so many of us try to take on these massive massive um, projects like somebody will say oh I want to lose 50 pounds and it's almost like you're setting yourself up for failure right and oftentimes what we have to do is actually take on smaller goals mm -hmm. even even though the big goal might be to lose 50 pounds you have to like first make smaller changes that have nothing has nothing to do with losing the 50 pounds and eventually it just kind of all cumulatively creates more positive impact right right totally that's really good advice so now yeah. you are racing this year um tell yes. us what's what is your next race what's um what's your plan <laughs> <laughs> um so my next race is actually in about two and a half weeks. I'm racing um, New Orleans 70.3, which okay. um, I won last year, so I'm going to go back and um, hope to defend, defend. that title. Yeah. Um, and then from there, all of this is in preparation. I'm actually right in the middle of my Ironman, key Ironman training phase right now, um, oh. getting ready for Ironman Texas, which okay. is the North American um, Ironman Championships. So those are my next two big races. And then... Um, you know, from there, I think I'll do a couple of 70.3s in June and July and then just start getting ready for Kona. Right. Cool. Yes. Sounds like a good year. And you did Texas last year, right? Or I like, did. It's a great race. It is a good race and it's a good course for me. I mean, I'm, I enjoy racing in the heat. I tend to perform pretty well in the heat. Um, and, um, I just, for whatever reason, I, I just like the course. You know, there's there's nothing that's really that spectacular about it, but it just kind of suits me and it's, suits my riding style, yeah, and, running and everything. So yeah, but you've done it. It's right? nicer than you think it's yeah. going to be, right? You sort of see it these is. flat courses on and think, oh, it's going to be boring and dull, but really, it's very pretty. And it isn't it, is. it isn't pancake flat, you know. No, it's not. You do I get mean, a I few rolling. Over, I think there's over 3,000 feet of climbing, which right. kind of, I guess, sneaks up on you a little bit. But, yeah, that kind of TT um, climbing where you stay in your position, but you go, yeah. you know, yeah. nice. But I, I'm actually, last year I had a pretty big um, full schedule and did a lot of racing and actually not a whole lot of training. It was just sort of like race, recover, race, recover. Right. <laughs> and um, so this year I'm doing a lot less racing and a lot more um, training and, and really kind of focusing on trying to strengthen some of the areas of my, you know, on my bike and on the run and, and really try to get myself to the place where I can go into Kona 
and hopefully be more competitive this year. Awesome. More competitive. Well, you did great <laughs> last year. So, um, <laughs> I did. I was pretty happy with that. Yeah. No kidding. There's no no kidding. <laughs> but that's the, that's the addiction, right? You know, you, you go seventh and then you want to go better. So <laughs> yeah. fantastic. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the show and good luck to you this season. Um, and definitely I'm hoping to be in Kona. So hopefully I'll be able to cheer you on again. Thanks to Sarah Pianpiano, Shimano, Cervello, Cliff Bar, Red Bull, and Antoine Jackson from Fame Productions 360 for providing the extra footage for today's show. For more views, news, and interviews with amazing women athletes, visit wispsports.com and join me, Sarah Gross, next time for another episode of Iron Women.